All right, historians, I'd like you to take out a blank sheet of paper. If it's unlined, that's preferable. Lined paper will work, work fine, but it just will look a little bit messier. I'd like you to title it Enlightenment. So we're going to take a few minutes to look at the Enlightenment and roots of the Enlightenment. What was the Enlightenment? Well, it was an intellectual movement in Europe. It was between the 1600s and the 1800s. And so events during that time period were profoundly influenced by ideas that come out of the Enlightenment, events such as the Industrial Revolution, events such as exploration, colonization, imperialism, migration. All of these movements and developments of the time period from the 1600s to the 1800s are influenced by these ideas. Even movements outside of Europe, because these ideas that develop in Europe spread rapidly to other parts of the world. So we find in India, intellectuals who are influenced by these ideas, such as Ram Ramahan Roy, uh, Pandita Ramabai and others who were exploring human rights, women's rights, and uh, the importance of natural philosophy. We find thinkers such as Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine, Samuel Adams in the United States, or in the British colonies, and then the United States, rather, influenced by these ideas. And we find some Latin American revolutionaries influenced by these ideas. So although these are European ideas, they influence thought through, around the world. So you read several Enlightenment thinkers. But one group of thinkers was really important, and that's the philosophers. These were the French, the French Enlightenment thinkers, and they were focused on a whole set of ideas. They focused on the importance of reason. The value of nature, the pursuit of happiness, oops, on earth, the idea that there's progress in humanity, and finally, the importance of the individual and rights. Now, they talked about these rights in different ways, but they th these were the five important ideas of the philosophers and indeed of all the Enlightenment thinkers. You might see those again on a quiz, five underlying ideas of the Enlightenment theorists. But the Enlightenment is kind of a grand name for this period. It has the sense of, wow, we're somehow better than everybody else. We're somehow something special here. And that's a little bit dangerous to think say when we're talking about Europe during this time period, because Europeans in general had a higher opinion of themselves than other people. Now, that wasn't true for all Europeans, but when we talk about the Enlightenment, that title for this movement of thought comes from a very Euro Eurocentric way of thinking. 
So although you must know this term and you must use it as I'm teaching you, I want you to keep in the back of your mind that this term itself has a Eurocentric bias to it. You don't have to say that in an essay, you can, but um, don't spend much time on arguing that in an AP essay, but when you get to university, you can certainly argue that to your heart's content. And uh, there's a lot of scope for that argument. But my question right now is what are the underlying effects of the Enlightenment? So we're going to draw here the foundation of Enlightenment thinking. Foundation of Enlightenment ideas. And we're going to, and most of these uh, foundational ideas are European in nature because the Enlightenment's a European development, but there's a few non European elements. The first is scholasticism. Scholasticism refers to an intellectual movement in the 1200s in Europe. The primary theorist, this is a name you have to know, is Thomas Aquinas. And if we're talking about his philosophy, it's referred to as Thomastic philosophy. So Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a monk, and he was part of a long history of monastic support for scholarship. And experiment. particularly in the field of genetics, breeding plants and animals. So um, the monasteries, and if you're not sure what a monastery is, look that up. The monasteries were places of learning and places where individuals could set aside, not could, but were required to set aside time to think and to write. And Aquinas was one of these individuals. Aquinas wrote a book, and you should write this down, the Summa, S-U-M-M-A, Theologica. It's in Latin. Summa Theologica was, was a um, really important milestone in the history of Europe. He combined reason with faith. And he said, these are not in conflict. Reason and faith are not in conflict, he said. So he opens the door for monks after him in monasteries and other scholars to pursue the development of reason without feeling that they were threatening their faith. Following Aquinas, or actually at about the same time as Aquinas, in another part of the world, we have Islamic scholars in Cordova, that's in Spain, until they until um, they were pushed out of Spain. And then 
in Baghdad in what was called the House of Wisdom. Until, until the Mongols came and pushed them out. The Mongols didn't just push them out, they destroyed the House of Wisdom. The House of Wisdom was actually a, a, a building. And it was a place where scholars were intentionally gathered together. And these scholars pursued Greek and Indian and Arabic ideas. So we have a fusion of ideas here that's happening in the Islamic world up until about the year 12, mid 1200s. And this scholarship gradually gets passed on into Europe by way of traders, by way of crusaders before that. And one of the most important concepts here is the concept of the Arabic numerals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And the base ten system. Now, before about 1200 and the Italian philosopher mathematician named Fibonacci, the Roman numeral system was used in Europe. Well, that slows things down tremendously. But after we have the introduction of the Arabic numeral system, we have an explosion of math and science. And we have what is called the scientific revolution. in Europe from the 1200s to, you can even take that up into the 1600s. Now, different books will give different dates to this. But we have the development of more sophisticated math and science. We have Descartes, who develops the Cartesian system, which is the XY graphs, um, and other things as well. We have Kepler and Galileo and Copernicus, not in that order. Uh, it's Copernicus, then Kepler, then Galileo. Um, all using mathematics and observation so we have here the development of observation and experimentation. So we have the combining of reason and faith with Thomas Aquinas. Then we have the development of observation and experimentation. And then what comes next is really important, but it's often overlooked. We have something called the Reformation. Martin Luther was a monk. Now, Martin Luther King Jr., who you all know about, was named after this Martin Luther. This Martin Luther was a monk that lived in Germany. And you should have learned about him last year. If you don't remember about him, you should check into your textbook. 
but he did not wish to rebel against the Roman Catholic Church. He sought to reform it. But the outcome of his attempt at reform opened up some very significant doors to new ideas. They weren't really new ideas, but they were ideas that had never been expressed in this way before. The first idea was sola fide, which means only by faith. So Martin Luther said it's only by faith that a person is forgiven. Now, you, say, you might be saying to yourself, well, how does this affect the Enlightenment? Well, watch carefully. He also said, sola scriptura. Only if shown true in the Bible. Not by religious teachers alone. You have to be able to show that it's true in the Bible, not by some teaching of the Pope or the church. Now, he was reacting against abuses, abuses of power, abuses of authority. He wanted to reform, but he ends up with something else that he didn't quite intend. If you say that forgiveness and knowing God is only by faith, and if you say that what is true about God must be shown through the scripture, you are saying also that the individual will matters. And literacy can aid faith. Now, this is a huge idea, and this is a huge idea. If the individual will matters and literacy aids faith, you've got something really powerful happening here. You've got an emphasis on the individual over institutions. So, so it's the individual that matters, not the church, not the king or queen or prince. So we've got these foundational ideas with which the Enlightenment would never have happened we've got the combining of reason and faith and the development of, of math and science sponsored by the monasteries and, and by uh, private donors later on. Then we've got observation and experiment that develops develop as important techniques during the, this time period as well. And then we have Martin Luther saying that knowledge of God and God's forgiveness is only by faith and only if it can be proven through scripture. And that in turn emphasizes the will of the individual and literacy. Put these all together and you get a strong foundation for the enlightenment a very strong foundation here. All right. So 